Hi, this is Kelly Reed, pastor of Pleasant Grove Baptist Church. Just wanting to give a, a quick sum up of the message that I gave on uh, this past Sunday for Mother's Day and the influence that Lois and Eunice had on their son and grandson, uh, Timothy, as we w well know him. One of the first things that we see that these women did and the influence they had on this man that we have two books of the New Testament written to him, uh, one of the first things they did was instill a respect for Scripture. So if you want to influence upcoming generations, this is a must. There is not a time in our history when Scripture, when the Word of God is not more ridiculed, undermined, or dismissed. You know, it's, it's, it's looked at as foolish to believe what Scripture has to say as anything that can be reliable. But that is so, so untrue, and it's, it's so what is most necessary in passing on faith is instilling a respect for scripture. If you look in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, Paul reminds Timothy that everyone who, who wants to live a godly life in Christ is, is going to be persecuted because they, they rejected Christ. They're also going to reject us and they're, they're also going to come after those who believe the Bible. So that persecution, that, that saying, how could you be foolish enough to ever believe that stuff, that's, that's exactly the same kind of things that they were getting at the very beginning of the church. But then in verse 14, Paul urges Timothy to, to hang tough you know, when those, those, those difficult times come. He says in verse 14, he says, But as for you, continue in what you have heard, learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it. That is so significant. That is one of the most important things about, about discipleship, about passing on the faith, is that you know the, those from whom you have learned it. And you must continue in it. You must be, deliberately be seeking after it. You have to learn it. You become convinced of it. Because it's the influence of relationship that helps Timothy not only learned these things with a head knowledge, he made a practice of owning it. He studied, he became convinced of its truthfulness. And he did this in many ways because of the, the, he saw it modeled in his mother and his grandmother. He had this love for scriptures because they had a love for scripture. So I hope, you know, if you're, if you're reading this as a woman, as a, as a man, I hope your children, I hope your grandchildren can tell that you have a love for the Word of God, that you have a love for Scripture. I hope they see you reading it. I hope they see you looking at it and studying it. I hope they, they, that it's not just a paperweight that's sitting on the table or on the shelf collecting dust. I hope you tell the stories of Scripture. I hope when questions come up or when situations arise, you point them back to what does the Bible say. That shows that you have a knowledge and a love for the Word of God. And that shows, that comes up here in this passage in Timothy in verse 15. So he says, you know those from whom you learned it. And verse 15 says, and how from infancy... You have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. You know, his, his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice taught the Scripture to, to Timothy from the very beginning. They didn't wait until he was older. They didn't wait uh, in, until some magic number or age. They started early on, and they read to him. They talked about these people these lives as, as in here as if they were real people. As if God really does move. You know, they talked about Samson. They talked about Samuel. They talked about David and Ruth. They talked about Abraham and Noah. They did everything they could to provide Timothy with the opportunity to learn <clears throat> all that he could about the Bible. In essence, they were living out the command that we see in the Old Testament from De Deuteronomy chapter 6, this powerful statement of faith called the Shema. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all of your soul, and with all your strength. That's one of the basic statements of faith within Judaism. 
But notice how that idea, this basic statement of faith, gets connected to the role of parenting, the role of passing on that faith. He says, these commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them upon your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. I mean, there is no part of your life where the scriptures are not supposed to be influencing, where the scriptures are not supposed to have something to say. So when you get up, when you lie down, when you walk, wherever you go, the word of God is to be with you and you share it, you talk about it, you impress it upon your children, you instill that love for the word of God, that God does move, that God does speak. I mean, this is a generational view of discipleship. It's a generational view of discipleship. Our children are our bearers of the gospel to generations that haven't even been born yet. And that's an exciting thing. That's, that's make, that makes us look at our children not just as the gift of God, which, which they are very much. I'm very proud of my two kids. But also that they are a responsibility for us. They are a privilege for us that God expects us to, to instill and impress upon them this faith that has endured for thousands of years. This, is, this generational view of discipleship. That's what Psalm 78 says. Verse 4 start talking about, starts talking about, he says, We will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children. So the next generation would know them and even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. See, we have to realize that the best, that the most frequent discipleship doesn't happen at school, it doesn't happen at work, it really doesn't even happen at church. The best discipleship is intended to happen at home from father or mother to child happening in happening in the home that's where God desires discipleship to take place every day he ha God hasn't charged you know peers he hasn't charged the school the government with the responsibility of passing on the faith he has charged families mothers and fathers church is in my role even as pastor is intended to supplement what happens at home to supplement what parents and grandparents are doing in the home so are you looking for ways to instill a respect for the word of god in the lives of your children you know, you need to be considering thinking of ways that you can show and demonstrate the value that the Word of God has in your life. You know, once or twice a week at church is not going to be enough to effectively pass on, pass on the faith to your children. I think we're seeing the fruit of that. You know, it's not enough once or twice a week to instill a love for Scripture. These two mothers, Lois and Eunice, they had God's Word in their hearts because they had internalized the truth into their own lives. They could then pass it on. They could then impress it to Timothy by talking about it throughout the day, showing you know, Timmy how the Scripture should impact every area of life. And that's where mothers and grandmothers, that's where fathers, you know, we've got to realize it's never too early to start teaching the Bible to our children. It's never too late to start if you haven't already, but there's, there's nothing that can replace your role in discipling your ch child's life, in discipling your children into the faith. God wants to use you to instill a respect for the Word of God in your children. It's, that role is not to be left to the professional Someone who gets paid to do it. It is supposed to be shared from those who love. You know from whom you have learned it. That's what Second, you know, Second Timothy three sixteen shows these benefits of what Scripture is. It gives us the foundation for how the Word of God is supposed to apply to our lives and, and even its source. He says all Scripture is God breathed. This is just after. 
he said, you know, you from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which you are able to make, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God breathed. All scripture comes from the mouth, the breath, and the life of God. And it is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. There's a lot of things that don't come natural to us in here. We need to be taught. The faith is something that is taught. Doing what is right is something that is taught and learned. But sometimes we have to be rebuked. Sometimes we have to be corrected. And not just told what to do wrong, or what we are doing wrong, but also shown what to do that is right training in righteousness and that is how we are equipped to truly serve God so we instill a love for scripture we also are supposed to instill an authentic way that faith that's what the second way that that we can make an impact in the lives of our children and grandchildren instilling this authentic faith we see this in 2nd Timothy chapter 1 just a page or so back Verse 5, he says, I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. So even though Lois and Eunice were believers, Timothy needed to come to the point in his life where he put his own faith in Christ. Faith is not something that's hereditary. It's not something you're born with. It is something that is learned. It's something that they see as it's modeled before us. And when these, these mothers, they model this genuine faith, this environment is set up where children will be motivated to want that same kind of faith. It's a sincere faith. That word sincere also refers to being something unhypocritical. You know, that's that's a major charge against the church these days is that we are it's full of hypocrites. But it's it's a sincere, it's a genuine, it's a living kind of faith. It was real without any pretense of something false or fa uh, facade. You know, literally the word sincere uh, means without wax. Uh, sin uh, with or without uh, siri wax. Um, the flaws, what they would do in, the, in that Greek culture, whenever they would make a, a, a marble statue or some sort of stonework like that, they would, if there were flaws, if there were cracks in the marble of the statues, they would hide them by taking wax and coloring it and, and filling all of those cracks in with this wax. So when you first took a look at the, the item, you would never see the flaw. But as soon as you purchased it as soon as you took it home and the weather turned hot all of that wax would melt out and the the flaws would be revealed and he's saying this is a you have a sincere faith you have a faith that doesn't have any of these things that are just covering over uh, uh, sins and that's just covering over these flaws there's no wax that's hiding who you really are it was because faith had be, become and, and taken a residence in, in, in Timothy's heart because he had seen it in his mother and his grandmother's heart that's why his faith was alive and real he knew their faith was real and it affected him see no one knows better than a child whether their parents faith is genuine, living, and vibrant. Notice that chain here. It goes from Lois to Eunice to Timothy. And it saddens me to, to see that there's no mention of a father or a grandfather in this equation. We know that Timothy's father was a Greek. He was, a, he was an unbeliever. Okay, he, he, uh, His father was not involved spiritually. His father may have even rejected his mother because of her turning to this faith in this new Jesus. But that the, the father's not, uninvolvement is, is a growing, is a sad reality for many families in America. 
the dad being spiritually absent, uninvolved, uninterested, you know, unwilling to be the spiritual leader in this home. You know, dads, you cannot fathom how important it is for you to be the spiritual leader in your home. But even without that influence that was it is so necessary these two ladies do show that even if the father is is falling and failing in this area there is still hope you still have that influence that you can put in it the spiritual impact of women can overcome even the spiritual failure of the men in the family so what, I, what i'm saying is, is this a mother can make that significant spiritual impact on her children as they grow up possess this authentic faith and Timothy is proof that that can happen so moms and grandmoms as you were considering this this Mother's Day you know realize if you want to instill an authentic faith in your children then you better take your own faith seriously and guess what that's not just unique to women men that is especially important for you as well take your faith seriously if you want to instill an authentic faith if you're just going through the motions spiritually, your kids are going to see right through everything you do. And tragically, many may do the same thing even when they get older. But if you are willing to demonstrate your faith consistently, you know, by reading the Bible, praying you know, with them, for them, attending worship, bringing your kids to, to what's appropriate for them to grow spiritually by participating in the life and the mission of the church, you'll send this strong message to your children. You are translating and incarnating scripture for them every day, and you are proving or disproving who Jesus is in those kind of moments. So as I think about the kind of faith that was passed on from a from mother to a, a son, I'm, you know, I'm convinced that a mother like this has to be more interested, and a parents, parents need to be more interested in her having her children know the Bible than to, to know all the characters on their favorite uh, cartoon, or, or more important than having the favorite toys. You know, she, the mom, the, the parents prioritize and rejoice over their children's souls more than their, their fashions. You know, their children's eternal life is more important than success in this life. Their children's relationship with Jesus is more important than their popularity in this world. Their children's standing before God is more important than any social standing. Her children's, you know, our children, their, their salvation is more important and necessary than any other accomplishment they can, they can be a part of, whether it be music, athletic, educational. You know, our children becoming a godly husband, becoming a godly wife is more important than being even a well-paid worker. If we are fulfilling the mission that God has for us rather than the type of mission that the world has for us. It is you and not the child that must set the agenda. It it's, can't be any other influence. It can't be the government. It can't be the soccer coach, the band or choir director, not their school, especially not the child themselves. I mean, left to themselves, children pick what they want more than what they need. I mean, all you have to do is, is give your kids a grocery cart at, at Walmart and say, okay, go get food for the week and see the kind of things that they will pick out. Most of them, anyway. You know, I hope you don't let your kids pick the menu for every meal. You know, junk food and chocolate would be a primary uh, element in all of those meals. I hope you don't let your children pick between going to school or staying home and playing video games all day. You know, you as a parent make that decision even because that's the best decision, what they need more than what they want. And their spirit needs to be a priority, something that is impressed upon them. But they, it's, they, it's impressed, not oppressive, because it is something that they see in you. To go along with this, you also as a parent, you know, instill a desire to minister. That's a third way to impact them. Instill this a desire to minister. You know, after Paul preaches in the city of Lystra, Timothy becomes converted. He, he returns a short while later. And if you look over in Acts chapter 16, Acts chapter 16, verse 
verse 1 it says, He came to Derbe and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. And as they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. So I see three things about Timothy here that, that were no doubt things and elements that were passed down from his influence from his mother and his grandmother. First of all, he was a, a strong believer. He was referred to as a disciple. He's not just a fan. He's not just a, he's not just somebody who's hanging around people. He Luke, you know, the author of Acts, he could have referred to him as a as a believer or as a Christian, but he chose to call use this word disciple. A disciple is a, a learner or a follower who has given up things in order to accomplish that type of task. One who was serious about Christ, not just going through the motions. And that's the kind of faith that he saw molded before him. Second, he had a good reputation. The believers in the area spoke well of him. People knew him as a man of integrity, as a man of the word. He was, he was rock solid before Paul had that extensive kind of influence on him. And again, this, this had a lot to do with the influence of his mother and grandmother. And then third, he was also available. And Paul wanted to take him along on the journey. And as you continue to read the book of Acts, you'll see that Timothy was eager to go with him, eager to minister. He knew it meant leaving home. He knew it meant facing hardship. And there's no way that this kind of commitment to ministry develops if it's not been encouraged, if he's not given permission to seek it or pursue it, to go after it. I mean, even... You know, when Paul stopped in Lystra for this second time, he enlists Timothy to be his special assistant to replace a, a, a man named John Mark. Paul refers to Timothy as his beloved son in 1 Corinthians 4. Uh, and in 1 Timothy 1, he calls him his own son in the faith. He had taken on that kind of a father role in his life, Paul did, because his own father was so unwilling. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul can't think of anyone like Timothy when he writes, I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. Paul thought very highly of Timothy and couldn't wait to unleash him for ministry. In fact, when, he, when Paul leaves the city of Ephesus, it's Timothy who is put in charge there. When he, Paul writes those letters, First and Second Timothy, it's because Timothy is ministering and serving as the leader, overseer, or pastor in the city of Ephesus. This is Ephesus. Ephesus, this young man was put in that position of leadership. So when we think of, of parents, when we think of moms and, and grandmothers and, and fathers and such, you know, it's in a position of influence in your children. Part of your job is to instill a respect for the Word of God, uh, the uh, responsibility to instill this authentic faith. But those are building blocks for instilling within your children a desire to serve others, desire to minister, to serve the kingdom of Christ, to serve others, to willingness to serve God, to make yourself available to him, to see yourself serving someone else, where life is not just about you and your own dreams, your own wants, and all of those types of things. It's about the kingdom of God, a willingness and availability to be used for God's purposes. See, our kids are to learn the Bible and to grow in their faith so they can become difference makers in their world, so they can share their faith with others, so they can minister in the church. They can minister where they go to school. They can serve those who are hurting. They can serve as missionaries. They can identify you know, their spiritual gifts. They can use them on a regular basis. That's the, what the truth of the matter is, that we are saved in order to serve. We are to be disciples so that we can disciple others. We are equipped so that we can evangelize. We are, you know, the word of God, so, so the man of God may be equipped for every good work. So we are equipped so that we can evangelize. We are sanctified so that we, we can be sent out to a lost and dying world. And that's, that's my job. That's my wife's job as, as parents to disciple my son and my daughter as they grow to be a young man and a young woman. 
to instill in them this desire to serve him wholeheartedly for the whole of their lives, that this faith becomes their own because they know from whom they have learned it. They know that my faith is something that is real. And I'm thankful that, that, uh, that, that God has given me that privilege with that. But you, know, you consider the importance of, of faith and passing it on, impressing it on your children. Turn over to 1 Corinthians 13. Consider your, your, the description of your child's life like this. 1 Corinthians 13 is a very powerful passage, more known in, as, a, as a passage on love and the significance of it. And it's a great chapter to look at the willingness of, of love to forgive and such. But he says in verse 13, I'm going to read through it normally first. And then I want you to, I'm going to change the focus just a little bit here. But he says, it says, if I speak in the tongues of, of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Now consider this when you consider the life of your children and the kind of things that we so often attempt to do in their lives. We so often try to focus our children on, on, on getting the good job, on, on their education, on their, their sports skills or, or things like that. And apply those kind of concepts or thoughts to this passage. You know, just consider that if your children have the best paying job in the world, but do not have Christ, they are only storing up treasures on earth that are destined to perish and burn. You know, if your children are the happiest people in the world, but do not have Christ, they do not know the joy of their salvation. If your children do the most good to help people in the world but do not have Christ, they labor in vain and will never be able to earn, you know, you'll never be able to be good enough to earn a place in heaven. If your children are the smartest and the most educated in the world and they do not have Christ, all of that wisdom and it is foolishness because the greatest and surpassing knowledge is that of knowing God and knowing Christ. So as you consider the opportunity and the privilege that you have of sharing a faith with your children, the call is to instill a respect for Scripture, to demonstrate and, and, and encourage them to have an authentic faith and then also this desire to minister to where they can be available, to where they can have this good reputation. All of those things are things that are taught and learned from those whom we know it. Thank you for watching. I encourage you to come in and, and visit us here at Pleasant Grove Baptist Church in Newport, Tennessee. We'd love to have you here and just let us know. Thank you.